everybody hello how's everyone doing just say let us know that you're all okay in the chat and that you can hear us is everything good Amazing, perfect. Okay, thank you for being on time. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna get running straight away. So today we have um, a prestigious kind of academic creative writer. But before we get into that, I want to quickly just give you a context as to what this course is about and how it comes together. So this program, New Politics and Afrofuturisms, is calling Black radical imagination and pop culture as powerful vehicles for propelling progressive social justice narratives to mainstream audiences with a focus on Afrofuturisms, Black activism, climate justice, along with political theory and practice. For those that are unfamiliar with the University of the Underground, um, it is free. It is a free, pluralistic and transnational university based in the basement um, of nightclubs with its headquarters in Amsterdam. But due to recent global events, this program is online via Zoom. Um, the, the, the title of this lecture um, or this talk is, is called Afro Pessimism Means You're Dead, Revolution Means I Love You. Now, just to give an introduction to the amazing person that we have with us today, we have Lindo Kule Ngosi, who is a writer from South Africa whose textual, textual work often emerges with installation and performance. She has written for numerous, uh, numerous local and international publications and has curated exhibitions and projects in galleries and in the public space. While floating across different genres, um, journalistic, reflective, experimental, her work is consistently insightful, rich in texture and engaged with realities. Linda Kukule's work as a, as a writer, um, curator, and project organizer is fervent in its radicalism, its honesty, and willingness to engage her environment and communities on the periphery. Beyond her writing, she's also engaged in, in interventions that explore the, re the realm of performance, employing a mixed media of texts, installations, and conversations. And on that note, just to go a little bit deeper with this, this specific talk is a series of prov um, provocations masquerading as a um, masquerading as a talk, right? So this is a this is a provocation that we're going to be dealing with, and I'll let Lindo introduce herself a little bit further so we can take a deeper understanding of what it is she means by Afro pessimism. Lindo, over to you. Thank you. Hey everyone. Um, yeah, I can't see anyone, so this is really weird. But hi, I hope you're happy and safe where you are. So thank you for the introduction, Chris. Um, just to introduce myself again, so I'm Lindo Gutlengosi, and I'm a writer, curator, editor based in Johannesburg, and I work with like text, film, video, and, and music. And I'm interested in using the artistic imaginary as a tool to investigate mechanisms of creativity, survival, art making, and hyper-violent societies and how this impacts artistic, creative, cultural production and the femme imaginary. So just to give a little bit of context, Christopher and I met a couple of years ago in Johannesburg. We were both artists participating in a residency um, around African future technologies. It was curated by the founder of African Digital Arts, Chip Chumba. Um, and there I was asked to speak about African future technologies and I veered a little bit off topic um, these ideas are very similar, but almost worlds apart in the way that we use these terms now. So instead of speaking about African technologies, what I spoke about was the technology of being African. Um, and so in a similar vein, with apologies to Christopher, but he should have expected it. <laughs> I'm not going to be talking about what I said I was talking about today. Um, this year has been one of constantly shifting urgencies that test our collective survival tools and our tools of future making. And our abilities to respond to them with the learnings provided to us from our intellectual, emotional and ancestral toolkits. So in light of that, I'm going to be presenting you guys with a series of provocations, a litany if you will, and I'm dedicating it to the peaceful protesters who were shot at the Leki toll gates in Lagos, Nigeria, just over a week ago now. And I'm titling this talk, it's running as Afro-pessimism means you're dead, revolution means I love you. So just over a week ago, on Tuesday, the 20th of October, 
armed military and security forces of the Nigerian government opened live fire on a peaceful huddle of protesters seated on the tarmac of Lekki Tollgate, waving flags and singing their national anthem. Sorry, I'm gonna play a video in the background. This is a Steve McQueen video shot in the early 90s, I wanna say 1991. And it was shot at Tao Dong Mine, just outside of Johannesburg, um, which was then the deepest mine in the world. It'll become clearer why, why I'm playing this in the background now, but I want to speak about what it means to be human in an economy of extraction. So, just over a week ago, on Tuesday, the 20th of October, armed military and security forces of the Nigerian government opened live fire on a peaceful huddle of protesters seated on the tarmac of Lekki Tollgate, waving flags and singing their national anthem. The security forces uninstalled CCTV cameras. They slowed down the internet. They waited until nightfall and then they cut off the electricity. They murdered the protesters. They blocked ambulances from entering the area to help those who were shot. They killed them and they made sure. They shut down the cell phone signal. They used fire barricades to trap protesters on the bridge. They sent military men in to finish off the survivors. They collected and hid dead bodies. They kidnapped those who didn't die or couldn't run away fast enough and dropped them into the lagoon. They killed them and they made sure. What has happened since has tested our performances of becoming human. President Buhari has threatened protesters with more violence while simultaneously acknowledging and denying the extrajudicial killings. And the latest bizarre move, he's demanding an apology from DJ Switch, a Lagosian DJ who live streamed the shootings on her Instagram failing which he's threatening to drag her to the Human Rights Court in Prague. The collective Black community has largely been silent. In a time of Black Lives Matter, why does what happened and is still happening in Nigeria float around us like a specter we are unwilling to confront? And so for this talk, we will all be operating as angels of history mining time and extracting history for any clues our ancestors may have left us to read this moment. John Akonfa's The Last Angel of History is an experimental video essay that uses the concepts of Afrofuturism to explore a Pan-African reading of displacement, Black culture, alienation, mythology, and futurity. Set as a work of fiction, the hybrid film introduces us to the character of the data thief who traverses space and time, jumping between periods of history to collect fragments of a Black past, pieces of a Black future, in search of a code that holds keys to the future. From the film, we come across the story of a bluesman from the 1930s, a guy called Robert Johnson. Now the story goes that Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil at the crossroads of the deep South. He sold his soul, and in return was given a secret of black technology, a black secret that came to be known as the blues. The blues begat jazz, the blues begat soul, the blues begat hip hop, the blues begat R&B. Now flash forward 200 years into the future, next figure, another hoodlum, another bad boy scavenger poet figure. He's called the data thief. 200 years into the future, the data thief is told as a story. If you can find the crossroads, this crossroads, if you can make an archeological dig into these crossroads, you'll find the techno fossils. And if you can put together those elements, those fragments, you'll crack the code. Crack that code and you've got the keys to the future. And you have one clue and it's a phrase, mothership connection. Operating as angels of history, we'll gracefully dig into our collective Black crossroads, communing with the works and words of Audre Lorde, Paolo Freire, Frank B. Wilderson, Le Paperson, Cornel West, my grandmother, Muni Deborah Mbangemi, and others. And we'll be presenting these fragments
for the understanding of a black, black collective past, present, and future. And so here are the fragments. Che Guevara says, true revolutionaries are guided by great feelings of love. Frank B. Wilderson is a professor of African-American studies at the University of California, Irvine, and is one of the founders of a philosophical school of thought called Afro-pessimism. Afro-pessimism is a critical framework that describes the ongoing effects of racism, colonialism, and the historic process of enslavement, including the transatlantic slave trade and the impact on the structural conditions, as well as personal, subjective, and lived experience and embodied reality. According to writer Vincent Cunningham, the term espouses no orientation toward the future, or does it give much of a damn for social fortune? Rather, Afro-pessimism sketches a structural map of human experience. On this map, Black people are integral to human society, but at all times and in all places excluded from it. They are in a state of social death a concept that Wilderson borrows from the sociologist Orlando Patterson. From Audre Lorde's poem, For Each of You. Be who you are and will be. Learn to cherish that boisterous black angel that drives you up one day and down another, protecting the place where your power rises, running like hot blood from the same source as your pain. When you are hungry, learn to eat from whatever sustains you until morning, but do not be misled by details simply because you live them. Do not let your head deny your hands any memory of what passes through them, nor your eyes, nor your heart. Everything can be used except for that which is wasteful. You will need to remember this one day when you are accused of destruction. Even when they are dangerous, Examine the hearts of those machines you hate before you discard them. And never, and never mourn their lack of collective power, lest you be condemned to relive them. If you do not learn to hate, you will never be lonely enough to love easily, nor will you always be brave, although it never grows any easier. DJ Switch on her Instagram Live a few days after the state sanctioned murders at Lakey Tollgate. We would run, we would come back, we would run, we would come back. And the only thing we fought with was our flags. A boy jumped on me, he was shouting, cover her, cover her. I didn't even understand why he did that. They shot that boy on my back. In the seminal text, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Brazilian educator and philosopher Paulo Freire argues for learning and teaching as a way to draw closer to a more radical and pathetic humanity. He posits that oppression is a system of dehumanization that distorts the humanity of both the oppressor and the oppressed. The oppressed are robbed of their rights, becoming subhuman, where the oppressors, in channeling privileges solely to themselves, become superhuman mutations. Dehumanization, he says, marks not only those whose humanity has been stolen, but also those in a different way, those who have stolen it, a distortion of the vocation of becoming more fully human. From poet Daniel Bozotsky, I learned that poetry is what happens when you translate the screams of the oppressed. In his book, The Performance of Becoming Human, he says, the water is frozen and we are sleeping on the rocks, watching the cows on the cliff and you tell me they might fall and break open and that sheep and humans and countries will fall out of them and that this will be the start of a bedtime story you will tell me on our very last night on earth. Come closer, you say with your eyes. Move your bloody face next to mine and rub me with it. We are dying from so many stories. We are not complete in the mind from so many stories of burning houses, missing children, slaughtered animals. Who will put the stories back together and who will restore the bodies? I am working towards the end, but first I need a stab, a very small slice. The stories, they are there, but we need a little bit more wit. 
We need something lighter to get to the end of the story. Did you hear the one about the guy who picked up chips by quoting oral testimonies of villagers who watched their brothers and sisters get slaughtered? I learned from Bozotsky that our bodies are heavy with many stories. Unspoken and unstudied, they multiply and mysticize like cancers. We must speak in order to heal. We must speak them even if we will not heal. In an essay for the Chimaranga Chronic, saxophonist Shabaka Hudgens probes the musical narratives of jazz and hip hop, paying outside the time signatures common to the diasporadic interpretation and orthodox, and orthodox analysis of music. He speaks about how Sun Ra believed in the power of myth and myth-making. He says, societies with agency have the power to create their own mythological structures. They can dictate the terms by which an imagined super reality is given prominence in the day-to-day -day life of the community. Repressed people lose the power to imagine, to recontextualize an interpretation of the world in the ways that it is handed to them. Poet Kevin Young from a speculative nonfiction collection of essays, The Grey Album. It would seem that the very denial of dreaming that society seems to impose on black folks, while it hasn't made us dream less, does seem to punish us for what dreams we do have. From Afrofuturism, I learned that our current structures like race in themselves are technologies that were created to justify colonization and slavery. How Franz Panon puts it is, I came into the world imbued with the will to find a meaning in things. My spirit filled with the desire to attain the source of the world. And then I found out that I was an object in the midst of other objects. Jean-Michel Basquiat said he crossed out words in order to enable us to see them more. Words like mother, like crown, like blood. Basquiat uses money as magic, as symbol and conjecture. I have no lines carved into my body, no roots rubbed into the splits to protect me. So I hold out the palm of my hands, the soles of my feet for you to finger the wounds should you find yourself doubting my pain, myself lacking. This is the sadness of God as a singular, the sadness of gods that exist as plural. I cross out the words so you can see them more. Words like mother, like black, like me. To protest my own erasure, I disappear. The sadness of stardust that lives like mud. The Isizulu word for moon is also the word for doctor. The name for the sun is also how we call day. Drunk one night at a pub, a Tosa man tells me that I do not know how to speak to men because there's no such thing as a Zulu man. In Isizulu, the words for ancestor and for sleep are similar. Also, the words for music and healer. In Isizulu, the words for a black person and the words for human are the same. Umundu, black person. Uban, Ubuntu, humans. Ubuntu, humanness, a connection with humanity. I am because we are. Cross this out so you can see it more. Cornell West implores us to remember, never forget that justice is what love looks like in public, just as tenderness is what love feels like in private. So I'm coming to the end of this, but I quickly just want to um, read something directly from the notes of, of Afrofuturism um, about understanding our own objectivity. But I also want to kind of, let me put it this way, where Afrofuturism says that we need to use the tools that we have contained in us, sitting in our bodies and figure out how to access these technologies 
so we can project ourselves forward. Afro-pessimism says there is no future. And so my argument is that none of these understandings deeply engage with the Afro that they have suffixed to their names. And the Afro, from my understanding, speaks of a collapse of time. So there is no beginning, past, present, future, end. All these things are happening at the same time simultaneously, all the time. And what does that mean if we take the Afro seriously? What does it mean if we collapse this time and this understanding of linear um, movement? What does that mean about us existing as objects and commodities and extraction economies? What does it mean about projecting ourselves in the future if you accept that there is no future because everything that is, is now? Um, and so in short, basically, these are the provocations that I'm, I'm sending forward. I'm thinking out loud and I'm thinking with and, and through you guys. And that's me today. So yeah. So great, thank you. Um, can I ask, so can I ask for everyone that was um, in the chat, just to please come off mute and just give an applause for Lindo. That was really beautiful. Amazing. Awesome. Gang, gang, gang. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> um, Linda, can I ask for you to um, stop sharing your screen just so we can talk and try and just start bringing out some of these questions? Zen. Great. Thank you for that. Um, there's a lot that was packed into that that I think it needs I to be. I thought we need to keep it short, you know? Yeah, I understand that. But, um, so initially, Linda was, pl um, was planning to do like a 45 minute talk. And then I think with the level of um, things that were at stake and what was being said, um, you cut it short in order to kind of pull these things apart a little bit more and a little bit more, a little bit more deeply, which I completely get. Um, while you're talking, I put in a couple of references um, and things that you mentioned. Um, just for those that are maybe uninitiated to it. So The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, um, Franz Fanon, um, Wretched of the Earth. Um, that's the book that I referenced. Was it a different one um, that you maybe- From, no, it was from The Wretched of the Earth, from the Fanon. Okay, my references are on point then. Okay, good. Um, and then we've got um, the key word Ubuntu, um, in which you, right. you didn't use the term, but that's where you, um, you use the definition. Um, so what- right. I, what I was wondering is while we people start developing their questions and putting them in the chat, can we scan over the text one more time, but just pull out key moments um, just to kind of pull apart a little bit? I can share the actual text with you guys if that's, that if that's be, okay, if anybody wants to see. That would be amazing if you could do that. Um, but just for the moment, just to kind I'm of- Can I know, please? Pardon? Can nobody laugh at my notes, please? Okay, no judgment. <laughs> um, one thing that I wanted to kind of get you to expand upon is the concept of Afro-pessimism when you talk about it being that the concept that, that there is, is no future. Where is that position coming from? Is it from a case of uh, there is nothing to aspire to or the fact that everything that, we, everything that we need is right here, so there will be no future? Can you just expand on the how that came about a little bit. So what I didn't do is that I actually wanted to read like the, the, the actual definition of, of, of Afro-pessimism. It's a framework, right? It's not, it's a theoretical framework from like critical African studies of understanding the world. And I wanted to actually read from um, Wilderson's new book. So if you just give me a second to pull that out, um, I think it would be easier to discuss the meanings of, of Afro-pessimism with the definition in front of us. But I will say that when I was first introduced to, to the concept of Afro-pessimism, everything in me said no. It felt um, antithetical to survival. Okay. It felt like at the core of it, it didn't speak to my very hyper-local understanding of, I'm trying to send you guys these notes, but I keep saying no. 
send it to me. Let me just email. And then yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll sort it out. Um, so because I understand, which is why I reference my grandmother as like my biggest theoretical framework, right? Mm -hmm. Because I understand Ubuntu to mean a black person. And I also understand Ubuntu to mean humans. And I also understand Ubuntu to mean humanity I am because we are. Mm -hmm. The concept of our complete and whole commodification and objectification mm -hmm. doesn't make sense because then it means that we're not human. It means that we're objects. And if we're objects, then we're dead. But if we're dead, then there is no future. What is the future of a table? What is the future of a rock? What is the future of a thing outside of how it can be used by capitalism and an extraction eco um, economy, right? Um, so this was my understanding. Um, it's not the most uh, nuanced or sophisticated way to put it. So I'm trying to find just an excerpt that might give it like a, a fuller, fuller, rounder meaning. Okay. Um, um, one thing that you mentioned just there is the existence outside of exploitation is the way that I kind of framed what it is that you just said, which is commodification and, and objectification. Um, and I think this right. is put it in context for, for the brief that the full-time students are undertaking. We also have um, visiting participants in the room as well. Um, but their task is to develop a visualization or a system that shows where and that articulates where people and the environment thrive um, together, which is an interesting idea in terms of taking what you've just said around this concept of um, existence outside of exploitation. How do we coexist with an environment that is mutually beneficial, um, not just politically and through acts, but also in terms of psychological um, understanding and positioning? Where do human beings see themselves in relation? To the environment, and what is the what are the forms of interactions and code of conduct, the understanding between that. Um, the reason why I asked you to flag um, your the further expand upon Afro um, um, pessimism is I think what um, Jill is um, leading to in her question, which is, do you think the current pandemic can function as a portal to new perception, um, because we are forced to. Um, continuously live in the present um, by being exposed to short and long-term time scales to reimagine re our perception of time. Jill, do you want to come off of mute and kind of uh, dig a little bit deeper with that if you want to? Jill? Um, I can't hear you. Okay, I think Wi-Fi is having some issues today. Um, okay, let me jump to this uh, definition. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to read uh, Wilderson's words himself. I think it will make for a better understanding. But in his, in his introduction to the book that he released this year called Simply Afropessimism, he says, Afropessimism then is less of a theory and more of a meta theory, a critical project that by deploying blackness as a lens of interpretation, interrogates the unspoken assumption logic of Marxism, post-colonialism, psychoanalysis, and feminism through rigorous theoretical consideration of their properties and assumptive logic, such as their foundations, methods, forms, and utility. And it does so again on a higher level of extraction than the discourse and methods of the theories it integrates. Again, Afro-pessimism is, in the main, more of a meta-theory than a theory. It is pessimistic about the claims theories of liberation make when these theories try to explain black suffering, when they try to analogize black suffering with the suffering of other oppressed beings. It does this by unearthing and exposing the metaphors strewn like landmines in these theories of what is so-called universal liberation to be true. If, as Afro-pessimism argues, blacks are not human subjects, but are instead structurally inert props, implements for the execution of white and non-black fantasies and sadomasochist pleasures, then this also means at a higher level of abstraction that claims of universal humanity that above all theories all subscribe to are hobbled by metaphoria. 
a contradiction that manifests whenever one looks seriously at the structure of black suffering in comparison to the presumed universal structure of all sentient beings. Again, black people embody metaphoria for political thought and action. Black people are the wrench in the works. So it's kind of this concept of fugitivity of, of black life almost being a rejection of capitalism, of extraction economies, right? Like to insist on living and being full and whole, insist that insist against your objectification and by objectification, I mean, you're being turned into an object. Right. Okay, let me pause you on that. Joe, are you back on? No, okay. I don't know why that is. Maybe um, let's play with that. Another Jill question. Is here. Pardon? I think Jill is here just muted. Um, she's unmuted. Unfortunately, the microphone isn't working, which is weird. But we'll, we'll come back to Jill. Um, can you can you just take a step at her question, which is talk, talking about does the pandemic offer basically an opportunity for this new perception to um, to the, Let's, let's go through it. Do you think this current pandemic can function as a portal to new perception because we are forced to continuously live in the present? So I guess, is this a question of thinking beyond our state of survival and thinking towards how do we create a repaired or a, a better way of living? What are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, that's been one of the stranger things is these conversations about how the pandemic allows us to imagine time or ourselves within time differently. Mm. Man, I live in South Africa and I'm a black woman here. And so we're constantly in a state of crisis and we are constantly in a pandemic. So for whom this reimagining is happening, I'm not sure. Um, for me, no, I have been in crisis. The people that I live with who are in my community have been in crisis and this is why Theory is not theory. When you're black, we live this. So the pandemic for me has offered nothing new, but to expose other people to the the way that we live. Right. Um, yeah, I don't I don't really know how to answer that. And maybe there's somebody else. I saw that there's a bunch of um, other people, South Africans here, who have. <laughs> something to offer but for me mm -hmm. the the isolation the extended moment of crisis the need to push towards thinking about future survival is a way that you've always had to think if you're black absolutely i think that that raised a really good um point in terms of the perception of the crisis which is um, the, the perception of the virus um i guess that was a really good slip in terms of saying crisis is that this pandemic has awoken people who had always been living in a comfortable situation and hadn't been in a state of flux for the first time. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I think is really important because for people that are living outside of a system that is built to sustain what it is that they stand for in, in its origin, hope has always been the, the thing that they've only had, but at the same time has also been um, the most dangerous thing, which is why futurism to some degrees, oh, one day we will be okay. One day, people have been saying that for hundreds and hundreds of years. And if you think about the continent, you're not just talking about the transatlantic slavery, which you date back to, let's say, 1500, 1600 with the Portuguese. You're talking prior to that with the Arab invasion, you're talking um, meant like, you know, 800 years worth of invasion and dissemination and breaking down. And the concept has been hope will lead us, having hope will eventually take us to a place where things will be good. Um, and I think people are now getting tired. And for the religious, this is where the concept comes from of this idea of heaven will be a better place. So therefore what is on land, what is here presently is, isn't the end all. So therefore there's less of a consequence here. Um, and I think this is where you made a really good point, depending on what, what you stand as and what you define your, your identity and what, you have no choice in to some degree in changing who you are. You are who you are because you are in terms of what you're born um, in yes. terms of that element. 
you have no choice but to articulate and to survive in that in that guise. Um, and that covers down to sexuality, gender, um, skin color, um, real, um, cultural uh, methods of identification in terms of how you survive um, within religious spaces, because you may live in a highly Catholic environment, but come from a more indigenous um, uh, faith-based system, and that might be at odds with you. Um, there's another question from D that says, um, do you believe the suppression of Zulu during apartheid and possibly current day South Africa, a form of dehumanization? Does your work in the arts and technology um, a vehicle to combat this erasure? Did you want to go in a little bit further with that or refine or something like that? Oh yeah, by Zulu, I mean the language. So okay. Yeah, it's, it's okay. I'm so confused. I know, I know. And I realized I did I should have put language and also excuse my ignorance, I don't have a a lot of knowledge about modern day South Africa. I can't I can't remember who it was, but I think it's Paulo Freire as well. And he makes this argument it might still be in the pedagogy of the, the oppressed, but he argues that the naming of things is how things come into the world, right? and stripped of language, you're also stripped of your own ways of navigating and understanding the world. Um, and so yes, the suppression of, of, of people's indigenous languages is simultane, is the same thing as suppressing their indigenous knowledge without being able to speak something into existence in your own tongue, then it doesn't exist, right? And so it's an alienation not just from your tongue and the things that you can do, but an alienation from the ways in which you can understand the world and how that, they, that can provide you freedom and liberation in your current systems. And everywhere you go, everywhere you go where people are oppressed and invaded, the first thing they do is to take your tongue, literally, right? In some cases, beheadings, keeping body parts as trophies, literally taking the head of a ruler. And then also metaphorically taking your head, you're not be able to understand yourself in your own language, you know? I don't know if that- No, absolutely. and the second part of that question is really how does your work becomes a vehicle? Is it, do you think uh, it's to combat this erasure? Oh God, I really hate speaking about like the meaning or functions of my work. I don't know, man. I don't know. I I more so find that like when I'm reading theory and grappling with understanding theory, I have to figure out what my grandmother would say about this. And that's a way of reimbuing my own language. And so I take these ideas to her. And so even this talk about Afro Afro pessimism, I guess, um, was me figuring out how to tell my grandmother that she's dead, <laughs> theoretically. You know? And that it didn't make sense. It didn't, it didn't sit as, there was such a big conflict. And the only way that I could understand it was to go to my language of what it means to be alive and what it means to be human. And that my humanity means that I'm connected to everybody's humanity, you know? Amazing. Um... Jill also wrote a comment. Um, sorry, Jill, I wish we could get the audio working. I don't know what's happening. Um, but I'll try and do my best and articulate what it is that you've put down. Um, she says, um, a recent piece in the New York Times by Kukutani, among the many casualties of COVID-19 is our perception of time. Without jobs or classes, weekdays and weekends, um, blur into one long Mobius strip of time, unable to make plans. We are forced to live in a continuous present, and yet some days we feel we've been transported to a world imagined in a futuristic novel. Um, and she mentioned that that's a good point. What are, your, what are your thoughts? I have a different perception of that, but what are your thoughts on that? Again, I live in South Africa. There have not been... <laughs> there haven't been jobs. We haven't had jobs. We're in a constant state of emergency. The police kills us. The government doesn't care. They literally looted COVID funds, like looted them. <laughs> you know what I mean? The funds that they were given to help save people, they stole them. I've been living in a dystopian crisis for a really, really long time. I've had to understand myself through poetry. 
and futuristic novels and Afrofuturism for a really, really long time. This crisis has done nothing new for me, you know. Um, but I understand that if you've never felt this before, it's one of the most terrifying things in the world. Mm. But what we're speaking about is that there are tools and the tools that you'll find to survive this time for people who've had to survive this for a really long time before, we're talking about black people, mm. have been surviving and speaking about this for a really long time. So if you're trying to figure out how to navigate yourself right now, you need to go to black thinkers. You need to go to futurists. You need to go to pessimists because they've been talking about this. They've been saying, hey, we're living in a crisis. Whiteness is a pandemic. Patriarchy is a pandemic. People needed a virus to understand what it meant. Right. And just on that note, I think um, just to reiterate, Joe was just highlighting that what you said previously speaks to that so well. So it was a really good point. Um, there was, I was recently having a conversation with um, an international recruiter who, who is working in this area of diversity, inclusivity and belonging. And she said to me that the time that the early stages where with the rise of COVID and then the rise of Black Lives Matter, and, or let's not the rise of Black Lives Matter, let's not put it in there. Let's say that the visualization to the point where people realize, yo, people are killing people and the documentation, the evidence doesn't even help. It, it doesn't help. And people saying, if we had proof, it would do something. Well, case in point, it doesn't. Um, mm. And what she was talking about is that she's never seen such a global um, effort um, in which the whole world is saying Black Lives Matter. And I, I had to explain to her that the whole world seeing it doesn't make a difference because the whole world isn't trying to be in a position to stop it. And... Yeah. With that specific point, is the co the the I, I think I heard so I think I don't know who said this. It may have been a conversation that I had um, where we talked about COVID as as an example of the great equalizer. It made everybody feel like they're vulnerable. So if you can imagine, there was a, something I watched online and it talked about what what is necessary to develop empathy for people to understand one another. And think about this in context to your um, your project is what needs to be developed to create a, a form of communication that gives you an understanding between who you are, um, about what you do and who you are and the subject or the person or the environment or the space um, in which you're engaging, engaging. What, is it, what are their means of communication? So being multilingual is something, not just in terms of like, you know, speaking French, English, Spanish, whatever, is are you attuned to picking up the signs of communication that are not completely obvious so and i wrote there that language is tone that that's linked to location that's linked to articulation which is why you will see in many places um, when people say oh but the victim never said anything well how can they say something if they don't have the words to say it mm. and that is a really important element which is why you teach the alphabet before you teach words to individual, right. right um there's another comment uh, that Chloe, do you want to come on? On let's let's hope your microphone works. Do you want to come off mute and express yourself? Um, just like rebuffing off what you're talking about, um, like the COVID crisis. I definitely also agree that it's not. I I mean I don't know. I don't think that it's an equalizer or anything like of the sort. Because actually, it's a way also for politicians to be able to um, kind of. Uh, liberalize the the social systems and the social structures that we have in in a way that benefits them as well so um so it's actually kind of deconstructing a lot of like social welfare systems that we had for example in france um but i i was curious with afro future with the afro pessimism um like what is you know for me societies really exist through and thanks to exchange like i know that in um, like Native American tribes, originally there was some kind of peacekeeping that was done thanks to exchanges of objects that was, was a sign of peacekeeping among tribes. So I don't know, for me, economy is still quite important. And um, I don't know, I'm just kind of wondering like what's the alternative that Afro-pessimism would offer? How could society kind of exchange or keep peace? Um, um, I'm not saying we have to profit off people, but you know, still have the exchange, I guess. What do you mean by keeping peace? 
Well, in um, that was like the first thing I learned when I took economics uh, classes that actually um, the first form of economy was among tribes exchanging objects in, to keep a peace. And if they didn't exchange this object every so often, then a war would actually be start would be started. Like it was a way of exchanging. Um, it was symbolic, you know, for like peace. Right. But I mean, we're talking about today, I can't, I can't think of any place that's addressed or at peace. <laughs> no, no, I mean? I'm not talking about like, um, the global economy. I'm talking more just in terms of like, um, exchange, actually, like at the root sense, economy is a question of exchange, like money is just a way to formalize that exchange, but society thrives and lives through exchange. I mean, we see that with COVID right now that, you know, if you can't, speak with people if you can't exchange like you just don't live anymore you're you're nothing so in it's kind of interesting because afro pessimism the way it's described is like to me a little binary to see um ex like i mean i'm definitely against extraction as well of course and and i totally agree with the whole rhetoric but um what's the alternative because if we don't exchange if we don't you know create we are creators you know we're, we're creative human beings so I don't know like what's the alternative like I mean for me the extreme alternative would also be not existing would also be being an object if we can't exchange our ideas or exchange things right but after pessimism is arguing that we already are objects that black people have been fully right and so what's the alternative yeah what's the sorry what's the alternative then because like if we totally stop um economy uh, explode that uh, that idea then then what's the alternative i mean so i think what we're talking about is not dismantling the idea of economy we're talking about um um dismantling the idea of economy being predicated on black suffering and black exploitation mm. the reason that we're struggling to imagine that is because even blackness was an invention to justify slavery, slavery and extraction and capitalism. This is why it's so hard to find any solutions. But I think, I mean, I see, I'm gonna, hey, he's gonna run away. Nolan, I think you might have a response maybe to that. I know you've been thinking a lot about this a lot deeper than I have. I have not been thinking about alternatives. I've been thinking about understanding what's happening now um did you want to invite Nolan? Nolan? he's right here but i can see his name on the screen i don't know is he <laughs> what okay i've unmuted you Nolan. thank you thank you so much for such a beautiful talk um, thank you this uh I, chloe i'm mean, to be honest i, I don't have a, a good response um to you because i'm not sure if i fully understand the point that you're making. Um, I think the way that some of us uh, come to understand economy and exchange uh, is first through a kind of mode of production. And Afro-pessimism, I think, articulates a certain criticism of capitalism uh, that identifies the role the black people and blackness plays in this mode of production. Um, so black people not only stabilize the kind of extractive political economy, but they also stabilize the, or rather black pain is the stabilizing structure for a certain way of understanding the world, which we can call like a kind of epistemic economy. I mean, even I think, and this is not a criticism, but I think in your question there's a kind of um, lacuna, like a, an erasure of the role that black people play in this economy. Um, so I think to, to take, and, and maybe it's just a question of like digging a little bit deeper into what uh, the criticism Afro-pessimism is trying to make. Um, but I think you'd have to think about not that Afro-pessimism needs to offer an alternative to the current economy in the sense that it's going to redeem um, 
kind of capitalist exchange, but rather that capitalist exchange, the basis of capitalist exchange is under serious threat um, through, a cap through an Afro-pessimist reading of the economy. So if you want to share things, I think sharing um, is at the basis of any kind of um, Ubuntu, anywhere that you see black or you see Afro um, as a prefix, sharing is kind of at the ground of that. Um, to trying to get into a kind of question of an alternative economy, uh, I think you have to start thinking 